All right, so thanks uh, for coming back. We've got uh, James Pritchard on the line with us. Uh, James, it's an honor to have you online, uh, but we do have some questions and uh, we want you to answer the best you can and have a little fun. So you are born in Australia, but you had an illustrious career with, uh, with Canada, Rugby Canada. Your grandfather's from Saskatchewan and that obviously benefited uh, Rugby Canada tremendously. Talk to us about your moves from Australia to England where you played professionally into Canada for international rugby. What was your uh, what was your process there? Um, look, t to begin with, all I all I wanted to do was I just wanted to play rugby. I just wanted to play footy, um, as they sort of say in Australia here. And I I wanted to travel. I just wanted to see the world. And um, previously, I'd grown up playing rugby league. And like as you may know, it's it started to branch out a little bit, but it was very limited on where rugby league was played. It was primarily Australia with a, like a speckling through the UK in northern uh, in the northern UK. But uh, switching over to rugby, it just opened up a whole new world of possibilities, um, especially sort of uh, with the likes of South Africa, uh, Japan, Argentina, Canada, the USA, those sort of places as well as Europe all playing the game. So um, when I sort of, sort of first switched over, I started to dig around into sort of... Um, the family sort of heritage, which for my dad sort of uh, had a family tree going, and sort of realised, hey, hang on, I've got, um, I've got, I've got Canadian roots here, so yeah, let's let's explore that a little bit more. Um, so it wasn't until I sort of uh, went over to the UK and started playing over there that I actually I seen a couple of Canadians playing, the likes of um, John Kennan, um, yep. who's sort of unfortunately sort of passed away now. He was sort of playing at Rotherham at the time uh, and Coventry over there. So I got to see sort of what the, the standard was like. And um, I thought, well, look, why not? Let's, let's give it a crack. Let, let's have a go. Um, and it wasn't until I come back to Australia, I was playing with Ramwick at the time. Uh, Canada were out here touring. This was sort of back in, or oh, this was 2000, I think it might, it might've been 2001. Okay. Um, they were, 2001, 2002, they were playing against Australia A um, at the time. And Australia A had just sort of, they'd had the likes of Wendell Saylor, uh, Matt Rogers, all these rugby league boys just uh, come over and, and start the game. And um, it wasn't the best of tours for them. Uh, we were playing a curtain raiser game to the Canadian Australia A match. Uh, I was playing for Randwick against Parramatta. And then I remember sitting in the stands and watching the game. And I think Australia A put sort of 100 um, on the boys that day. So it wasn't, um, it wasn't a, a very good day for them at the time. I know they were missing a lot of their European-based players, but um, I had a chance to have a chat to then coach David Clark um, and just say, look, um, I'm, yeah, I've got heritage here. Look, I'd love to be given an opportunity. And he said, uh, okay, look, I'll well, keep an eye on you um, in the UK, but if look, you're serious, um, you need to come to Canada and prove yourself. And how so old I, uh, yeah. What were you at that point? I was uh, 21, 2021. Okay. So um, it was, I had, a, I had a contract in the UK with Bedford. So I went over there and I played that season, my second season over there with them. And then it was, uh, yeah, let's look, pack up and let's give this a go, see how it goes. And I moved, uh, moved out to Saskatchewan. Moved in with a gentleman called Carl Fix, who uh, looked after me while I was out there, and uh, look, played with it, played in the Super League for the Prairie Fire, and yeah, look, the rest the rest is sort of history there. Well, it's uh, it's it's quite a journey for sure to kind of pick up and move from, you know, Australia, beautiful country, and let's let's make our way to Saskatchewan, one of the big Prairie provinces in Canada. So it's it's uh, it's quite the journey for sure. Um, you played in four World Cups for Canada. I didn't know this until I dug it up. I, I didn't realize that you'd, uh, you'd played a little bit in 2003. Uh, and you finished in 2015 as a Wiley veteran. Like you put in, I think, 10 appearances at World Cups. What were those experiences like for you representing Canada uh, at four different events? Um, it, it, is hard. it is hard to put into words when people ask well, what's it like. Um, let's say you spend, well, for me, I, I sort of spent my whole life growing up. Um, I was sort of playing rugby league or, or some sort of the code in the back garden with my brother. And you watch it on TV. You watch all these superstars playing in sort of 
packed stadiums in front of thousands, uh, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people. And you never sort of imagine, you, you always sort of wish um, you, you might get that opportunity, but you never imagine that it could happen to you. And when sort of I, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Clark sort of said to me, okay, you, you were on the plane to Australia, um, it, it sort of didn't really sink in until we landed here. And you got to see, um, I'd say, uh, growing up in my home country, in front of my friends and family who had never seen me um, before play for Canada. I'd had a few games previously, uh, but they were all in Canada. No one had ever seen me play. So to have that opportunity to play in front of friends and family, ex-coaches, people that had seen me grow up and play was immense. And I think uh, I know I, it still sticks in my head. My first game um, was sort of walking out uh, the park at Melbourne and I was sort of standing next to the Welsh team. <laughs> and out of nowhere, my eyes just started to well up and I started, I started to sob. I was standing in the tunnel. I was standing in the tunnel ready to run the field and I started to sob. I just couldn't, oh. it just all hit me at once. Um, this, like what was actually happening. Right. And look, I, again, it is hard to explain um, the feeling you can, I know I, 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 I've never sort of taken drugs or anything like that, but <laughs> you can sort of compare it to a drug addict, that it's something that becomes so addictive when you're involved uh, in that. It is just like playing the game becomes so addictive. Yeah. It is hard to sort of uh, imagine sort of not doing it anymore. And yeah. um, to be involved for so long, I was so lucky. Um, I, 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 I say, I, I thank God every day that I was so lucky to be involved for so long and to play in all those tournaments. Um, some people, they never get the chance, um, right. whether it's injuries or that. So for me to go through and play four, um, look, I, it is still hard to, be, hard to believe. Yeah, it's and, amazing. Yeah, and to play in front of your home country and then sort of travel to places like France and New Zealand. And then, of course, um, to finish off sort of in England, where I'd sort of spent the majority of my career playing. Um, yeah, I, I just, like say, I say, if, if one word was described, I would say lucky because I've had opportunities that um, like people wish for um, that they never, they never get to achieve. Rugby's given you a lot, but I, I, I'm pretty sure you've given quite a lot back to the game itself. Um, you finished your playing career. And as you mentioned, you kind of, you picked up coaching over in England. Talk to us a little bit about coaching. Uh, is it Amp Hill? Yeah. So I, I've been coaching for a good, probably 10, 12 years now. Um, I sort of, I started when I was at Bedford. I sort of, uh, it was all, always, always something that um, I wanted to get into. Uh, look, I, I, even when I sort of played at Ramwick, I'd always sort of listen intently on what the coaches were saying, look at, at how they sort of uh, uh, conducted themselves. And it was always something that I was always sort of interested in a pathway that I wanted to take. So sort of when I had the chance in Bedford um, to sort of go and do a bit of coaching, I jumped at it. And then, of course, it's, it's along the way, it's progressing, going up those, those, those levels and just trying to make yourself a better coach. And so, so I first started at Luton, sort of, they, they were sort of, they're just south of Bedford. And then sort of from there, progressed on and sort of, uh, I've coached sort of my, my uh, son's team, um, the juniors, which, which is quite fun. But then I've gone on that? to do the Bedford, Bedford Academy uh, before moving to Coventry and then Amptool. As, and then from Amptool sort of uh, uh, come back here and have been sort of uh, picking up the coaching with brothers here in uh, Brisbane. How old is he, your, was your son's team that you coached? Uh, they sort of, I started with him sort of the under fives and they're sort nice. of now into the under tens. So nice. it is a, it's, a good, it's a good little break. So from coaching men's to uh, <laughs> at elite level, to sort of kids, yeah. it, it's brilliant because there are so many takeaways you can get from both and, and so many crossovers. Yeah. Um, people forget that sort of uh, when you're coaching men, uh, like sort of 20, 30 year old guys, they are just big kids and yeah. they're there. And honestly, at the end of the day, they're there to have fun and enjoy themselves and, and learn some new skills. And that gets lost a little bit in the professional sure. game. It, sure. it does. It, it's like, say it's the professional game is so, uh, so tense nowadays um, that we're sort of losing, losing the fun. 
because why why did you pick the ball up in the first place and why did you play the game and and it's good it just brings you back down to earth and there's and i've learned so much from coaching kids that i actually take over into the professional game now That's and it's crazy. something that, that i'll be doing for as long as possible my uh, my wife and i run a rookie rugby program here where we are in rossing new brunswick um called the little blacks um don't be offended <laughs> No, look, it's it's absolutely brilliant. That's how my kids started. They started in um, what they call little ruggers over here, and it's it is it's about having fun. It's getting the ball in their hands, and if you can, can and let's say if those kids can continue to have fun as they progress through, they're gonna keep that for ball sure. in their hands longer, and they're gonna want to play. And then ultimately, at the end of their careers, they're gonna want to give back. It is. It's cool. We've got uh, we've got kids as young as four. We start at age four. And parents will come to us after the first or second week with a picture of their kids sleeping with his little rugby ball that he gets for, for registering and stuff. It's pretty cool. Yeah. That's and that's what you want. That's exactly what you want. That's how you want to get them involved in the game. Exactly. Um, so I'm assuming you would have watched the World Cup in Japan this past fall. What were your thoughts on how Canada performed? Um, what do you think Canada needs to improve and kind of move up in the world rankings? Um, Look, I, I, I was disappointed, um, as I'm sure a lot of fans were. Um, let, let's look. Let's get this right. I'm not disappointed in the guys' effort. I know. I know. As a player, you go out there and you give a hundred percent. No one Absolutely. ever. No one ever goes out there to um, lose or miss tackles or, or, or anything like that. Um, what I'm disappointed in is um, the what comes from above the coaching those sort of little things um i'm disappointed in the guys that make the big decisions that should be looking after the players giving them the best opportunity to perform on the field and i thought that that wasn't the case i thought the guys those that those that played those players were let down greatly by sort of those people behind the scenes that, that should have should have done a better job of preparing them for the world cup now you you have a look. There's players in there, like there's there's players in there that will step into most international sides individually. DTH put him on the wing for Australia. Put him on the wing for England. Yeah. He would not look out of place. No, the likes of Tyler Ardron. You, you see what he does for the Chiefs. That's right. Put, like you, you throw him into any one of those top six sides, he would not look out of place. Uh, Jeff Hassel went fit. Yeah, those sort of guys. Um, so we've got, we've got those players there. We've got that talent. It is just getting the best out of them. And I thought um, I've probably, I'll probably been a, a, big, a big critic of that for, for well, five years now, since yeah. the 2015 World Cup and before that, a very big critic. But um, it's, hard, it's hard to do that from the sidelines. I haven't, I've, I haven't been involved in, in behind the scenes or anything like that. And I say I haven't met Kingsley Jones or, or Henry Paul, Richard Wigglesworth, Ke Kelly Brown, those guys that were involved. But all I can go on is uh, feedback from the players, what the players yeah. say. And um, I can only draw my conclusions from there. Yeah, your buddies with a lot of those guys still, right? So Yeah, look, look, it's you, you make you make relate you make good relationships with those guys and, and it's and like for me it's hard to let go. Yeah. So it, it's hard to let go. So I like to con constantly keep in contact, find out what's happening here, what's happening there, be a little bit nosy and, and see how everything's going. And unfortunately, it, by the sounds of it, it, it hadn't been going going that well for a while. Well, hopefully hopefully there's a rebound coming up, uh, coming up soon. I, mean, I grew up in the 90s, uh, 80s and 90s, but watching Canada at the 91 World Cup, uh, you know, going into the quarters and everything like that, it was... Uh, we had this big hope as a nation that we're we're going to crack that you know potentially into the tier one level of rugby and it, and it just it kind of has gone downhill and um, I think I think Canada's I think Canada's suffering an identity crisis. Um, I think they need to decide where where do we want to progress at. Does it does it need to be sevens or does it need to be fifteens? Yeah. Now um, I'm I'm probably going to get hounded hounded by a lot of people here, but I thought seven started our downfall in 2015. Uh, we were so reliant on sevens players 
yeah. uh, in that tournament that um, I, I thought, I believed, and I still do this, we should have won two games. We should have yep. beaten Italy and we should have beaten Georgia. They're two yeah. games we should have won. Um, it's, look, again, you can't criticise the players, but you can't ask players to play a full seven season and then without, let's say, and then come back into 15s and your key playmakers, your nines, your tens, your 15s, your 12s, those guys that they haven't played sevens all year and then ask them to step up into an elite competition, a World Cup, and think they're going to perform. I say, totally Ch- different games. Chansey, like say, he, look, he, even they said he was 10, 10, 10 or so kilograms off where he needed to be as a 15s player. And they're asking him, expecting him to perform with some of the world's best uh, like that. And you can't ask the likes of Nate, who is a phenomenal player. Yeah. But like say, 10, playing 10 for sevens and then playing a 10 for a 15s is a whole new ball game. Yeah. And it's, it, is, it is just unrealistic to ask any player to step up at that level with little to no preparation. And that, that, so that was my biggest sort of right sort of coming into that. And I know that a lot of people might think that's um, sour grapes and I hate that. I was just so disappointed that we went and that was the first World Cup that we've gone yeah. through without winning a game. And it just killed me that I was a part of that and I couldn't do anything to stop it. And I think from then on, it, it's that we got that inner fight between sevens or fifteens. And I'm a firm believer that sevens should be a pathway through to the fifteens game. Right. Sevens is a great way to get young people immersed and involved in the game. I say the Vancouver Sevens is brilliant to get people watching and think, wow, what a game. I want yeah. to get involved. But then once, once they sort of get in there and play in it, it should be, okay, here is your pathway. This is what you want to be achieving that 15s. And I think for too long, we, for too long we've sort of coupled with the idea we can be good at both. Yeah. That, that you can't. <laughs> um, and again, I'm going to get blasted for this. We don't have the players. Yeah, look, we don't. And I'm, again, I'm going to get blasted for this. But look, out, outside of those smaller nations, no one cares about sevens. you got to, like Australia, New Zealand, England, Scotland. Ireland don't even have a sevens team on the thing. Those, those big countries, they don't care. They don't give two hoots about yeah. sevens. It is about 15s. And that's what they drive for. But yeah. say to have a good seven team, yeah, that's a bonus. But... Are we putting all our resources, all our top players into that? We're not. 15s is where we see ourselves. And, and Canada need to make that decision. Okay, are we gonna are we gonna throw all our resources at sevens or do we wanna get back to where we where we should be? And I believe we should be in that top twelve. I honestly believe we have got the players in that. We need to be in that top twelve. Do you think major league rugby that started up in North America will help that? I think it will. Um, just right now, no. It is still in its infancy, but it is a stepping stone. It is a start. It's it's probably ten years yeah. behind where it should have been. Yeah. I, I honestly yeah. believe it. It should have been. It should have been like there ten years ago, and then maybe yeah, we would be like say competing with the likes of the Premiership and Super Rugby now. But we're still ten years behind. Say so all those big names they're bringing across, great for the exposure. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they are. It's they are past their past their use by day. They are big names, but they're not wanted anywhere else. Yeah. So we, like I say, that we can keep on driving that. What's the good thing about that is it's professional rugby, and it's getting our guys um, used to professional training, that professional atmosphere, that life. Right. I still think that there are better competitions in the UK in the premiership, the championship, and even national one, okay, over there, like your top 14, your, your, pro, your pro 14, those competitions are still the pinnacle that I really think guys should be aiming for. Like if, if you're good enough, you should be over there playing with the best players in the world, okay, playing at the championship, playing in the premiership, because it is hard rugby. It's, yeah. I say the champ, 
and, and National One, they're 30 odd games a year. And they're, they're playing against like up and coming England players. All those players coming through academy, they're England, they're Scottish, they're Irish players, they're A players, they are current or ex England internationals, Scottish internationals, Welsh, Irish internationals. And you don't get that sort of competition playing in Major League. Right. Um, I, I, look, don't get me wrong, it is a stepping stone. And it's brilliant as well. I think we need, we need another Canadian team in there. Yeah. And it gives exposure to our coaches as well. I think that's yeah. one thing that Canada needs. It needs more homegrown coaches. And that's one thing that disappointed me in the World Cup, um, that we're bringing in the likes of Wigglesworth. We're bringing in the likes of Brown um, to, to cover these positions where I honestly think we, we've got that covered. We've got those assistant roles covered with Canada. Guys just need to be given the chance, um, not bringing these sort of guys with little to no international coaching experience will we'll no coaching experience at all at an international level and expect them to to push Canada forward and compete with the big boys. That's fair. I've, uh, I've been, I've pushed for a couple of years ago for my level three, but I keep being told that uh, rugby Canada is very strict on who they allow into those, uh, into those upper echelons, I guess, of coaching. So I've just kind of backed off and, Coach my high school, I coach provincially, but just kind of leave it as is. And that, that's – look, that and look, that's, that's just bullshit. Um, they should be pushing for as many people as they can to, to progress, and especially if got, people want to take it on their own to, to do that. Um, my, my big thing was I wanted, I wanted to do my coaching in the UK. Um, I pushed and I, I got accepted for the level four along the elite performance coaching route. And that sort of, that took me 18 months. Uh, well, yeah. well, total, I got rejected the first time I went through. Um, and I had to re and I had to sort of re-register and go interviewed and, and do all that. But um, it was something that I, I wanted. And to work with some of the, those top coaches in the, in the UK under some of the, the best sort of mentor, mentors as well was brilliant. And, I, and I, really, like, I really think UK at the moment, England, is one of the top environments for coaches to be involved in. Yeah. They are so, look, coming back to Australia, I, I really think UK is so far ahead of, of, of Australia, especially. Um, I, I sort of can't talk for New Zealand, but so far ahead of Australia in regards to youth coaching, in yeah. regards to that elite pathway where players are progressing on, the getting juniors progressing on. But um, I, I can't believe they're not, they're not higher where they are. Um, that kind of thing. They like England really should be New Zealand of rugby. They really should be that that far ahead of everyone because with their player base and their coaches and how they're progressing that game through, they really should be so far ahead. But and look, look, five, ten years of time when those juniors come through, you you may see that. But and I think that's where Canada they need more homegrown coaches involved and they need to be encouraging that. I they can't just rely on ex players. And look, there's so many ex players that want to be involved, but they need people who are passionate about the game yep. to basically put their hand up and, and then go from there, then progress from there, have, have the coaching cinemas, get them all involved. And then you see how they're progressing and you're able to go choose those elite ones from there. hundred um, percent. I'm just, I've got, we got a little bit left here. Um, I sit and talk to you all night, but I think <laughs> zoom only records for about 40 minutes. So if it happens to stop, I'll yep. send another link so we can finish up. No, of course, of course. I think we're right around the 40, so I'm not... I don't know time <laughs> um, when I'm looking through my questions here, sorry, you've kind of you've answered things uh, before I had a chance to ask, which is, I guess, which speaks to your passion for the game. And you're, you, you're, you're not holding back, and I love that. That's great. Um, when you left Rugby Canada, when you left internationally, did you go on your own terms? Was that... Was that something you said, like, my body's had enough or I'm, I'm at an age where I need to think about something else now? How, how, did, that, how, how did that happen? Um, that's sort of a yes and no question. Um, I'd, al I'd always set the 2015 World Cup as that would be my swan song. Um, that, that would be, yeah, look, I, I'd struggled through um, a little bit. I, I'd sort of picked up a little niggle in that. And then just before the 2015 um, World Cup, just before we sort of got together at camp, I sort of um, did uh, the burst room, my knee popped. So um, I was living off painkillers um, sort of to get through that. Uh, to not get selected for that World Cup initially was a massive sort of uh, 
a massive kick kick in the guts um, yeah. because you'd like say I'd had such a privilege to play for so many years and go through and do all that, and then to not sort of finish on on the way I wanted to finish right. was was devastating. Um, I still, even even though sort of I played that um, that uh, Romania game at the end. I still see the Samoa game in Toronto as that was my last game. That's where I was able to put in 110% and walk off that field knowing I couldn't have got given any any less or any more, right. sorry. Um, I put everything in there. And um, that was, and even like say when Tyler Ardron went off, I had the captaincy um, for, for pretty much, I think it was 60 minutes of the game. Yeah. And, and that was, and for me, that was one of the that was probably the highlight of my career to be able to lead those boys and even like say and have that victory snatched away right at the end from a yeah. line out. Um, I I couldn't have been any prouder. If that was one defining moment um, for my Canadian career, that would be it. That I got to play, I got to captain um, my side. Even though I won't, the C won't be next to my name. It was as Kenneth, uh, Tyler come off. He said, "Pritch, you're, you're captain now." And, my God, that was one of the biggest, um, biggest highs in, in my career. So, yeah. um, look, and, and then getting called in at, at the sort of, at, at the end of the tournament, even though it's sort of like five minutes at the end, uh, it's a bit devastating. You, like, like every player, oh, look, I'm a competitor. I want to play every minute of every game. Yeah. I, I, like, I want to get in there and compete and sort of not do that. And, and then sort of to be on the end of a losing side, it's devastating, but... Look, oh, I wouldn't give it up uh, for anything. Yeah, look, I, I'd had my time. I, I, I never wanted to be given special preference. Um, I wanted to compete and I wanted to sort of be there on my merits. And look, look, sometimes fairy tales, they, they, they don't exist. Um, and unfortunately, yeah, mine didn't work out how I wanted. But I was fortunate enough just to be there right at the end. And I say have, even though it may only be token, but that... that sort of bit of game time in that fifth World Cup. You get that yeah, count. it's it, yeah, it counts for sure. It's obvious listening to you how passionate you were as a player. Are you taking that into your coaching? Like, what are you what are you taking into your coaching that you learned as a player as to how to treat your players, how to how to teach your players, things like that? Um, just look, I've learned so much um, even since finishing, but going sort of uh, doing all these courses on this elite course and then. Um, I've got into a little bit of reading, which I, I never sort of used to do. So <laughs> reading how other coaches used to do it, getting into the mindset of players, and look, I, I tr look, I I was there for I was there to have fun. Um, I, I used to get sort of uh, I used to get lambasted lambasted by coaches for mucking around and, and at training and doing that. But look, I, ultimately ended. I was there to have fun. I was there to enjoy myself. It was a bonus that I was um, getting getting paid to do what I love. It was, a, it was a job, but I love doing it. And all my sessions, I want the players to come away having that same feeling. I don't want them to be there. And even if we're doing skills or whatever, it's, it's not a chore. They're having fun. They're having a joke. But in that right. same time, they, they're putting in 100%. Yeah. But you can, you can put in 100% or 110% and still enjoy yourself. Still yeah. have a bit of fun about that. And that, that's my biggest takeaway, whether it's kids or whether it's the adults. You you got to come away from the session with a smile on your face. Um, I know, like, I know, I'm, I was my harshest critic playing. Like, like I'd come off and think, "Jesus, that was a, oh, a shit game." But and people go, "No, no you played, you played well and all that." But and that's same with coaching. Yeah. I, I want my players come off with a smile on their face. I want them to have a bit of fun, and I and I want them sticking around after. It may be you show them a couple of drills or that, and then after the session's finished, they're they're practicing their drills on their own, and, and that's well. I'm a winner there because I didn't ask for that and they're doing it yeah. off their own back. So, yeah, if, like I say, if I could put in one, one word of advice, it was, look, you've got to make it fun. You've got to make yeah. it enjoyable. You've got to make them want to come back. Exactly. Okay, for more. So, uh, look, I've gone from coaching at a professional level at Coventry and Amtel to over here where they still pay their subs. Every player in the club pays their subs. They don't get paid to play, yet they're playing, against, they're playing with and against Queensland Reds players. They're playing against Australian players. So, um, but they all pay. They all pay their $500 um, to play and put the jersey on. So, 
look, you've got to make it fun for them. Yeah. They're, if they're putting their own money in and not getting paid, you've got to make it enjoyable. And exactly. You've got to make them come back. That's awesome. Um, any chance you'll ever, uh, you and your, you and your partner will ever think about coming back to Canada and taking up coaching over here again? Or uh, look, that, look, I, I, honestly, I would love to, I would love to be involved, um, with the uh, Canadian rugby once again. Um, it's, look, from the time I finished in 2015, I've been trying to, I've been trying to stay involved as best I can. Um, it, it's hard being, like say for me, especially being in the UK, it was hard to begin with. Yeah. Um, I tried working, uh, I was working with Gethin Watts uh, for a little time. He was sort of in charge of sort of the pathways um, yeah. with Canada. And what we were looking to do, we were, we were trying to set up a um, Canadian qualified uh, program. So what we were looking to do was um, find and sort of uh, pick out, well, not pick out, but get in touch with any players of Canadian heritage in the UK. Now, um, the likes of, uh, Wales, Scotland, Ireland, they sort of have their little academies pictured around. So any players with um, Ireland heritage or Scottish heritage that are playing in English academies, they'd sort of pick out and they'd bring them along. And we were looking to do something different with Canada. We were That's trying right. to sort of pick those players that are playing in the premiership academies or even playing with England in those junior academies. And look, there's such a high dropout rate um, in those academies that if these players sort of drop out, we're offering, offering them a second chance to sort of play in a national rugby, to say, yeah. look, okay, look, you may not have made it for England, but look, here, here's an option. Look, you've got your parents are Canadian, your mum's Canadian, your grandfather. So look, give this some thought. Um, if somewhere down the line you want, you want to give this a go, look, we'll push you onto the, the right channels. We'll push you into the 20s program or to the 20s coaches to have a look at you or the men's or the sevens. And uh, that was something sort of, quite passionate about and something I tried to get up and running. Um, unfortunately, since uh, Gethin's moved on, he sort of moved to Bristol and heading up their academy at Bristol as the manager there, that sort of uh, died in the water and I, hadn't, I haven't heard anything um, for over a year about that. Right. Um, but look, yeah, I, look, I'm passionate about, about coaching and passionate about Canada. And if the opportunity ever arose um, and the time was right, I, I would definitely definitely jump at the chance to come back and give back to uh, Canadian rugby. I, so, think be, I think that'd be great. Yeah, hope, hopefully, uh, hopefully sort of um, one day sort of, whether it's with major league rugby, um, we get one, one or two more sides in that, or if there's a chance with, with the sort of uh, any of the national sides. Um, it's yeah. But uh, look, say I always leave the door open. I am passionate and, and I do, I, I do have a strong will and, and voice. I'm, I'm like, say I do say what I, what I think and what I feel. Um, and I think, I honestly think that's what's kept me in, in sort of involved in Canadian rugby, especially involved as a player for so long. Right. I was, uh, I was a bit of a nose. I, I would sort of the video be constantly into video, be constantly into the coaches about what do I need to do this and that. And it was hard to, hard to forget about me because I was constantly in their faces. <laughs> so I think that played a big part in me being around for so long, but uh, look, yeah, that, you got to be passionate about what you do. And that's one thing I am passionate about. I do love my Absolutely. coaching. I do, I do love my rugby and, um, yeah, anything to stay involved. That's awesome. All right. Uh, just a couple last things. Not to, uh, I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you have any good rugby stories you can share with us? Um, oh. <laughs> you know, that's not going to throw anybody under the bus too bad. Yeah. And I, I don't know about, um, I don't know about anything at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of the ones a lot of the good stories that um, I had were when I first sort of started which I don't know how they'd go down nowadays um, <laughs> everything being so PC and that uh, yeah a lot, a lot of them involved Jeb at, at some stage <laughs> he told and, me uh, the yeah. ones <laughs> oh yeah yeah I'm sure he didn't tell you the best ones uh, that he was involved with uh, yeah it's <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to remember of one that doesn't come off um, quite sort of, uh, yeah, quite rude or anything like that. We'll save that for another time. I'll, yeah, I have to say that for a couple of drinks where, yeah, there's definitely no recorder on and, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chauncey and Jeb want to get on at the same time and I was told that uh, Chauncey needs some spiced rum to make it interesting. Um, so I think we're going to try that next time. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, um, Jeb, I think, yeah, Jeb won't need much. He'll just need no. a bit of encouragement and uh, <laughs> he, yeah, he'll be right there. You've got to listen to that one. Jeb, Jeb was pretty, pretty good when he was on. So if you get a chance, listen to his, uh, listen to his chat. Um, this, this just just caught my attention today. I mean, the coronavirus virus is everywhere. Major League Rugby here in, in North America is shut down. NHL shut down. NBA shut down. Um, but uh, there's still Six Nations games happening. Um, Watch Joe Marler, Mar- Mahler last week grabbing Alan Wynn Jones get a ten game ban. What are your yeah. thoughts on that? Um, look, I understand why he. I understand why he did it as a joke. Look, um, I've, I've, I've done it. So I've, I've been playing against people I know. I haven't done it like that, but I've done the odd flick um, just to try and get them rattled. Those sort of little things. Um, and look. Years ago, that may have been part and parcel of the game. You used to do that to get a reaction and try and win a penalty and all that. Um, but look, this this day and age, you, you just can't do those sort of things. I understand it and I do have sympathy. He did it as a joke. Look, off the field, I know I know they sort of know each other and uh, they're not they're not best of friends, but they are sort of they are uh, accomplices. They do know each other, so yeah. I understand that. Yeah, like it's doing it to a mate sort of thing on the field, but you've got TV cameras there. And Everywhere. the big thing nowadays, it's, it's about retention of, of youngsters. It's about yeah. yet getting youngsters involved. And if you've got mothers seeing that, um, how, how likely are they going to put their kids into the game um, yeah. and let them play if, if things like that aren't going unpunished? So what, while it's, it's sad to see the um, larrikinism, uh, as an Australian term, uh, go out of the game. That yeah. having a bit of a joke and, and and messing around, that's starting to disappear out of the game. Everyone just seems to be so serious. But look, yeah, it's it's a shame, but I can understand why they had to do it um, and, and involve that that ban. But well, look, you are you're a role model, um, and, and look, say so you are a role model for kids. And unfortunately, in these times now, which is sad, you can't do those sort of things because um, everyone's, everyone's got an opinion now. That's and sure. whether it's right or wrong, um, it's the masses <laughs> usually been out. Okay. He had a big Even, smile on his face when you did it too. Yeah, that's the thing. <laughs> and look, I, look, I've had it done to me. Like, I know they haven't been on camera and it hasn't been in that, but you have a joke and it's – you have a beer with a bloke after the game, those sort of things. But it's seen by the greater community. No, no doubt they would have. They probably would have had a laugh about it. His teammates, uh, Alan and Jones' teammates, probably would have ribbed him about it. Yeah. And, and same with Marla, and they would have had a laugh and and a beer and all that. But it's those people that that aren't used to that sort of thing. It's it's those people seeing it for the first time and and comparing it to someone grabbing someone and a stranger on the street or on the tube or on the bus. Yeah. Which it's totally out of context, but yeah, it's it's sad that things things have, have come to that. But uh, it's it's the it's the day and age we live in nowadays. If you haven't seen Jones's response there, just go on YouTube and and look it up. He's he just played it off like yeah, you know. Yeah, that's that's the that's... thing. It's, look, I'm 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 that old school as well. I'd love to see rucking back because <clears throat> yeah, I know I know when I played. Um, God, God, God forbid if I fell on the wrong side, I knew not to fall on the wrong side or I knew not to do things because yeah. we knew what would happen. But um, yeah, it's, it's gone now to the day. It's, it's, it is the way of the cheat. It's what can I get away with yeah. without getting penalised? Um, yeah. How can I bend the rules without getting penalised? And yeah. yeah, unfortunately, rugby's got a big problem with, with that sort of thing. And I would like to see some of the old stuff come back, but... It never will, not with the way the way the game's going. Yeah, some things I agree definitely need to be tweaked to make it. Uh, I don't know if open ups the word more, but I, I I agree. Like the lack of rucking nowadays, it's uh, it's strange where you you know somebody gets tackled and there's one guy on each side just kind of leaning on each other. It's, yeah, what's the point? I what's think, happening here? Well, I think now I think like my, me personally, they need to get away. They need to get away from the jackal. It's yeah. just, okay, people go down and it is just you, you ruck over. Anyone who goes on the floor, it's a penalty against. And yeah. you, don't, you, get, you win the ball by rucking over it, whether it's a yeah. tackle defence. Yeah. And I think they really need to sort of go to something, something like that. 
because this this tackle and these people over the ball, it's it's a fifty fifty and it's it's making it a mess and it's slowing it down and it's causing people get hurt. Yeah. yeah, people are getting hurt. That's yeah. the thing. And if you just teach, yeah, okay, we're just going to a straight ruck. It's whoever rucks over and wins that ball fairly like yeah. that. That's how we play it. And yeah, yeah but okay, look, I'm I'm no expert, but I don't know, I'll leave it into the. But it, like like many coaches, they bring in a new rule. It's okay. How can I bend that rule to? Yeah, uh, yeah in my favour. Look, yeah, uh, they, they can bring in. They can bring in all these different tackle heights and this and that, but you're going to get as soon as it's brought out, you're going to get defence coaches. Okay, how do we bend that? How do we use it to our advantage? Or yeah. attack coaches doing the same, and it, it just brings up more problems. Yeah, oh, I mean, over here we teach my high school team. We teach like under the ball. You know, we we want them to get them around. You know, below the below the hips and knees. Um, yeah. But the big thing is, you know, we've got some pretty tall kids, and it's like you got to get under the ball. You're going to get called every time, and when you're teaching high school, you've really got to make sure that they understand those safety parameters around dangerous tackles. But yeah, it's a challenge. And, and, sure. And nowadays, like say I used to like say as a backs, I was always taught when you're sort of tackling when they go defend you, you knock the fend down and, and you wrap and you get them to yeah. the ground. You can't do that nowadays because as soon as you knock that fend down, it knocks them off balance and you knock around the neck. That's right. Sort of so yeah. I know as, as a tack wise, I'm teaching players going with fend. Because if, like more often than not, you're either fending him off or he's knocking your arm down, and you're getting a penalty from it. Yeah. And and I'm just, look as a coach, I want the best. I want I want the most big, big, biggest advantage. Yeah. So that's how I'm teaching my players to go into tackles now. Yeah. And then defensively, it's yeah, okay, go for defend. You got to go. You got to go the legs, or you try and knock the fend up. Yeah. And it's hard, but yeah, like I say, coaches will find a way around it. Yeah, for sure. All right. Well. It's been great chatting with you. I just we're going to end here with our uh, with a question and answer period. I said earlier that uh, Chauncey and Jeb both went four for five. Uh, the, pre the pressure's on, pressure's on now. Pressure's on. on. Yeah. Cole Keith, who plays for Canada now, he went three for five. He's uh, he uh, he wasn't very happy, but we'll get him back <laughs> on a little bit later as well. All right. So, question one: What year? If you don't get this, I'll be a little disappointed. Uh. <laughs> What year did Australia win the Rugby World Cup? Was it A, 91, B, 99, C, 2003, D, 2007? 99. 99, correct, good. All right. I'm this on the one, board, I'm on the board. <laughs> this one, uh, I, I, one, of the, uh, one of my good friends at work that I coach with, I messaged to, uh, he's from Brisbane, and he, uh, he hates when I bring this up. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm not an England fan, per se, for rugby, but I like to do this just to rub it in. Yep. 2003, Australia faced England in the World Cup final. Who kicked the game-winning drop goal in extra time? Was it A, Stephen Larkham, B, Will Greenwood, C, Johnny Wilkinson, or D, George Bregan? Uh, I'll tell you what, this gets replayed over and <laughs> over again in England. Like, whenever the anniversary comes up, it is on 100 times a day. It's, uh, yeah, it's Wilkinson. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. That's, that's enough of that. All right, question three. You're two for two so far. Canada made it to the quarterfinals of 1991, the only time they've made it out of pool play. Who did they lose to in the quarters? Was it A, Australia, B, France, C, England, or D, New Zealand? D, New Zealand. Well done. Three for three. All right. <laughs> Who has scored the most tries for Canada? Is it A, DTH, B, Winston Stanley, C, Gareth Reese, or D, Taylor Paris? Uh, we always had a running thing um, here because I was always ahead of him. And um, I remember I poached one or two off him a couple of times and he wasn't happy about it. But um, he ran me down and he ran me down pretty well. Uh, so, yeah, DTH on that one. It's good. Yeah, he ended up with 38. All right, four for four. Last question. All right. Who is the leading Australian point scorer of the rugby championship? Is it A, Bernard Foley, B, Magito, C, Quay Cooper, or D, Matt Burke? This Ooh. is marbles. This is, this is it. The current rugby championship. Is, um, ooh. Oh, rugby championship. Oh. Let's ha can I have them again? Yeah, A, Bernard Foley, B, Magito, C, Quay Cooper, or D, Matt Burke? Oh, that's a tough one. 
Um, can I go Matt Burke? Oh, well done. Ah, oh, there we are. Right. <laughs> he ended up he had 271 points Foley. Uh, and uh, Foley's not too far behind. He's about 20 or 30 points back right now. But Okay. Matt, yeah. Matt Burke, well done. Yeah, Matt, like I say, Matt, back in the heyday, that was the heyday of Australian rugby where that was scoring points. So, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, I'll have to uh, I'll let Chauncey and Jeb know that you beat them. Ah, uh, good. Yes, yeah. Please do. Please do. <laughs> Listen, uh, thanks very much for uh, thanks very much for chatting with me. I loved it. Been a, been a pleasure. Uh, we'll have you on again later on as well. Uh, yeah, no, happy to. Chauncey's uh, Chauncey's asking if you can co-host some, so maybe we can get him in the room and. and yeah, no, that sounds him. good. Yeah, we just got to get him a have him. Uh, he needs a couple of drinks to open up and loosen up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> All uh, right. Thanks, James. Enjoy your day and. Uh, Keep safe down there. Pleasure, Jamie. Thank you very much for your time. Cheers, mate. Bye. Cheers. Thank you.